Hey, Ruiz. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks for coming over to give a talk. We seem to have a pretty good audience here. It's great. Okay. So, sorry, we're running into the human space. Okay. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Ravi Chandra here uh, uh, today. And uh, just, to, just to give a bit of history, of course, uh, um, um, Ravi uh, um, is a postdoc in the Center for Translational Data Science uh, that in turn uh, is in a partnership with the, with the City uh, Informatics Hub. Um, that, uh, that's one of the heads that I'm wearing now uh, from that. Um, and uh, so uh, Ravi uh, has a long history and with working with machine learning recipes in different application areas. Uh, one of his particular interests is uh, neural networks. Um, and uh, uh, so we have a particular uh, project uh, funded at the moment. Um, it's, um, it's a special research initiative that's funded by the University of Sydney. Um, to, uh, to, um, and it's uh, uh, oriented towards uh, using some of the tools that we've developed here uh, in the Earthbyte group. Badland software, um, and uh, there's another software called PyRead that is integrated, being integrated into it, uh, that will essentially allow us to model surface process erosion, sedimentation, carbon in platform growth, and heat growth, and depth uh, through time, depending on you know, sea level change um, uh, and, and subsidence up if you name it. And so, um, because there's a lot of uncertainty um, in the running these models through time. Um, the, it calls for uh, statistical tools uh, to uh, to understand the uncertainty in these uh, uh, physical models and to, uh, to optimize them uh, um, in the end. And so, so this is sort of the context, uh, the background to this talk. Uh, so, without further ado, over to you, Rohit. Thank you, Dietmar, and. Uh... Thanks for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, um, I have a lot of slides, so I will be rushing uh, through this. Uh, the topic today is uh, about tackling climate change problems with uh, machine learning methodologies and uh, discuss some prospects for climate extremes, particularly cyclones, uh, uh, geological uh, and geocoastal modeling, particularly uh, landscape dynamics and uh, um, uh, reef, uh, coral reefs. So uh, this is the brief outline of the talk. Uh, uh, firstly, going to the introduction of machine learning methods, particularly for people who probably don't have any background in this area. Um, so uh, what is machine learning? Uh, it's a process of learning from data and uh, you have some model that uh, adjusted or optimized and uh, essentially that is the, the learning process and uh, machine learning uh, uh, methods uh, are the, uh, there are a number of machine learning methods and one of them is neural networks and uh, there are many others such as support vector machines Gaussian processes and so on and uh, some of the major uh, uh, categories of tasks by these methods are for classification prediction clustering and control so um, Basically, anywhere, if you, if you have some data source, you can use machine learning algorithms to do some tasks over it. So uh, machine learning, uh, this is just an artist's interpretation. It is, of course, uh, motivated uh, by how humans learn, by, by uh, adjusting ourselves, correcting ourselves from time to time uh, to get over or to uh, master some task. The task could be driving a car, driving a tractor, or um, even learning how to uh, talk when we are growing. Neural networks are uh, one of these uh, machine learning methods that are uh, motivated by biological neural systems, the brain. And uh, basically the human brain has uh, billions of neurons um, with uh, trillions of interconnections between them. But however, a neural network 
artificial neural networks that we have uh, mostly deals with thousands of connections and sometimes the very large networks in deep learning platforms have um, uh, millions of uh, interconnections. So, um, just as in the biological brain, there's a neural, which is a single processing unit. Uh, in the artificial neural network, we refer to it as a neuron as well, but uh, it has some uh, computational pro properties. And uh, the interconnections between neurons are called weights. Uh, and in biological, biological area, uh, it is uh, called uh, synapses. And there are prominent neural network architectures, which uh, are feed forward and recurrent architectures. And this is just a, a view of, uh, of the interconnections in the human uh, brain, the synapses, and the way uh, they communicate, the neurons communicate through it, it themselves are electrochemical processes and uh, some charges that are fired from neuron to neuron. So there's a huge biological literature on this, which you could refer, we could refer to it later. Um, uh, we go into the major neural network architectures. Uh, so feed-forward neural networks. Uh, here, this is essentially a feed-forward neural network. You could uh, imagine, um, basically, a neural network is a, is a model that involves vectors and matrices. So the weights, weights here from the input to hidden units are uh, represented by a matrix, and these weight set of weights as well. And the out hidden units and output units all are vectors. And essentially, you have a, have a data set from which this neural network input uh, to hidden weights and hidden to output weights uh, are adjusted over time. And that process is called learning. And uh, the dynamics of uh, the uh, feedforward neural network can be uh, described by this equation. And basically, basically, each of these neurons in the hidden layer and the output layer, they uh, do a weighted sum of incoming inputs. And this is described by this equation, where Wij is the weight that connects from input to hidden, for example, and Xj is the, the input that you get, and plus uh, theta, which is a bias. And uh, basically, uh, you have whatever is input here multiplied by the weight plus whatever is input there multiplied by that weight plus whatever is the input there multiplied by the weight that connects them and that is uh, passed to a sigmoid function. So the y that you got there is passed to uh, some transfer functions and there are a number of transfer functions such as sigmoid hyperbolic tangent, piecewise linear functions. So most commonly the sigmoid transfer function is used. Um, and uh, uh, training uh, neural networks. Uh, so uh, uh, one of the earliest attempts to train a neural network was through the back propagation algorithm, which uh, employed gradient descent. And gradient, gradient descent is a numerical optimization method. It's uh, older than neural networks, of course. And the idea is to uh, uh, use gradients to update variables. And uh, in the back propagation, the gradients are used to update the weights. And uh, the, the output of the, the way the neural network is trained is by uh, uh, adjusting those weights so that your uh, target output and your, uh, the difference between your target output and your desired output, the target output is whatever is the, the output of the neural network, as in this case, the outputs that you get here, so that a time comes when that output is very close to the output that is given in the data. So uh, you want your neural network to mimic your data set essentially. And the difference between them is the error and the goal of learning is to uh, uh, minimize that error, which in this case is the sum of squared error. And you uh, obtain gradients, which is the change of uh, the, the error with, uh, over change of weight. And through that, you adjust the weights. So um, the, I'm running a neural network course, and there's more material, a lot of material on this that I, I will share with you later. Um, but uh, 
since we cannot cover all these things in detail, I'll just uh, go over a simple example. Uh, one of my first projects in my, towards the end of my undergraduate was to, to, you, to, to first of all code neural networks from scratch so that you learn how they really work. But there's a lot of libraries now, and uh, for example, Keras and so on, that uh, they have already coded for you. You don't have to code it, and you can just apply it. But uh, at that time, uh, my professor, Professor Christian Omlin, he gave me this project about conservation of some endangered species, which is a, a plant in South Africa. It's a flower, and it has some medicinal values. And it was, uh, it is getting, it is endangered and uh, about to be extinct. So uh, uh, there's some data there, which his students actually, with the collaboration with uh, another professor, they collected this uh, data of the, the, the types of places this, in terms of soil, the height, the rainfall, and so on that these plants grow. And they, um, they talked to the experts in the field who were uh, <clears throat> involved in uh, conservation of these plants, and they had a set of rules, basically, of uh, which areas it is, uh, uh, it is good to plant them, actually, in which areas. So we had a set of rules, and we had ground truth data, and we used neural networks to um, in, uh, we inserted this uh, data into uh, neural networks. It's called a connectionist module or neuro-based computing uh, approach where we not only used the data, but we also used a set of expert knowledge, if and then rules. So usually people say that neural networks are uh, black box uh, methods, but you could extract rules from a neural network and also insert new rules into a neural network to improve uh, your uh, model. And also what we did later, we extracted uh, rules from this neural network. Sorry, the, the figure is a bit old because I, I, I just tried to convert it from my PDF and don't have the source of the paper. <laughs> so uh, you kind of uh, extract rules from the neural network and then you will get these type of rules again, which describe the data more properly. Or, and then you can compare those set of rules with the expert rules and talk to the experts and say, hey, these rules that you have now, they don't really describe your uh, ground truth or data well, or the places where the uh, Renoster world is growing. And these rules are now outdated because due to the changes in the environment and so on, you need to update your rules. So uh, this is one way to uh, protect uh, the environment. And uh, this is just a basic example. And uh, neural networks are uh, continuously used for time series prediction. And this is my area and, uh, of research. And this is just an example of how a neural network is used for time series prediction. You slice the time series, uh, which is this. And it can be any time series. Uh, into windows and then you use that to train your neural network for one step or multiple step ahead prediction. Um, so uh, at the moment we are still in the background uh, of machine learning and neural networks. I'll move to uh, deep learning. Uh, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of interest in the term deep learning these days. What is deep learning and uh, what is deep learning versus machine learning and so on. Uh, just to clear that uh, deep learning is a method of neural networks and neural networks is a method of subfield of machine learning. So deep learning is not machine learning, but it is uh, like a grandchild of machine learning, let's say. So uh, basically the neural network that you saw in the, uh, in the beginning, the simple neural network, you have more hidden layers and connections and uh, that describes a deep neural network, but uh, uh, it doesn't mean that you just uh, take a neural network and add uh, new uh, layers or neurons to it, you are making it any better. Deep uh, neural networks are special uh, neural networks called convolutional neural networks that are mostly used for um, computer vision applications. And uh, for example, you have 
you have an application where you want to, uh, you have a set of images where you want to uh, classify car, trucks, and bicycles, and you have a um, huge data set of images. And essentially what a deep neural network does, it has a number of uh, uh, pre-processing uh, layers which does on the fly feature learning. So in the beginning, uh, uh, in the early days, uh, this feature extraction was uh, a focus of uh, um, computer vision, uh, of the field of computer vision, where there's so many various algorithms were used, for example, age detection and so on, to, uh, to extract features from these images. But what a deep neural network does, it combines that feature extraction uh, component within the neural network. So you have a series of additional uh, input uh, layers, which are called convolutional layers or pooling layers, and they are used to extract features essentially from, uh, from these images, and they are passed to a feed forward neural network essentially, or even it can be passed to a recurrent neural network. And through that, you can recognize uh, vehicles, trucks, and so on. Uh, there's a number of applications uh, of this uh, also in speech uh, recognition application, autonomous driving systems where you get input from a um, camera to uh, steer your vehicle, and then computer vision applications such as face gesture and object recognition and uh, others. Uh, I have worked with uh, some of them, for example, face recognition to assist uh, uh, visually impaired persons using your mobile phone. But uh, for this, uh, uh, there's a very important application just recently, which is detection of geological landforms on Mars. So uh, I know that uh, you guys here are from uh, these, these backgrounds, various backgrounds, and you have a lot of data and applications. Uh, we can have uh, build systems through uh, deep neural networks on those data sets if they are to do with images, for example, or some signals, which could be even sound signals. Um, so uh, this is a very interesting uh, application. It was just published last year about a detection of different type of contours in Mars. So you have autonomous uh, uh, detection of those contours through a convolutional neural network. Now we move into another uh, category of uh, neural networks called recurrent neural networks. Unlike uh, uh, feed for neural networks, recurrent neural networks have uh, feedback connections. And th therefore we have this, uh, uh, this uh, equation here that describes how the feedback connections uh, are implemented. So uh, this is a diagram of a recurrent neural network unfolded in time. You could view it as a feed-forward neural network or a very deep feed-forward neural network or a, a stacked feed-forward neural network. And they are used for a number of interesting applications. And uh, the training algorithm for recurrent neural network is uh, back propagation through time. And it employs uh, the gradient descent algorithms. Uh, the, the challenges, uh, of course, is in local convergence and vanishing error gradient problem, uh, where if you have a case where the neural network goes more than 10 or 15 uh, time steps, this is one, two, three, four time steps, but if it is more than 10 or 15 time steps, whereas in real uh, data sets, for example, signature verification, the, the time steps goes a lot more than that, and you could have hundreds of thousands of time steps in your data then this uh, architecture won't be able to train. And uh, to uh, address that, the long short-term memory networks were developed, and this is uh, very popular now, uh, and uh, uh, part of the Keras uh, uh, and other machine learning implementations. And um, another way to address them is through uh, evolutionary algorithms. Uh, neuroevolution employs new, uh, evolutionary algorithms, which are known as global optimization methods. And uh, when you are uh, deriving, uh, for example, uh, the training of, uh, when you are training to uh, use backpropagation and you are deriving this uh, 
the gradient uh, descent, the delta rule, uh, you have to take in account that uh, the, the activation function you use is a sigmoid, then you, if you use a 10H activation function or different other activation functions, you have to write a different set of uh, equations and implement it for derivating the back propagation. So the back propagation is fast, but it is uh, uh, for new architectures, it, it, you need to derive uh, uh, the learning algorithm. But whereas in the case of neuroevolution, views the neural network, it could be recurrent or fit forward as a black box. It doesn't uh, um, depend on uh, gradients. And uh, just an overview of back propagation through time and uh, neuroevolution. So uh, in, in my research in the past, I have uh, used uh, uh, a type of uh, neuroevolution method called cooperative coevolution. So basically, uh, uh, evolutionary computation, or evolutionary algorithm, or a genetic algorithm is uh, uh, defined by a population of solutions. Cooperative coevolution is further breaking the neural network regions into different uh, subcomponents, and then uh, 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 using different subpopulations to evolve them. So these. Uh, methods are quite flexible and they can be generalized to different neural network architectures. And uh, basic, uh, the overview of the algorithm for training uh, uh, element recurrent network. So uh, this was more of the, the background. Uh, the, the purpose of uh, this was not to go into detail but just to introduce the terms and uh, I will show you how I've used some of these methods in, uh, in climate, climate extremes. Any questions so far? <laughs> so, um, the f one of the first projects we did uh, in the beginning in 2015, I was in Fiji then at the University of the South Pacific. I met uh, there was a meeting and there's a, there's a climate change center there. And we, we discussed about how we can use machine learning for their problems. And somebody mentioned that there's abundant uh, climate data for cyclones actually available. And then uh, we uh, used neural networks, recurrent neural networks as a black box to predict cyclone wind intensity and tracks. And uh, then uh, the, the, when, when we use neural networks as a black box, uh, meaning that we just use the standard algorithms to train them. And uh, this is an example, the data set of the, sorry, so of the South Pacific Ocean for the last 30 years. And all the cyclones that um, uh, occurred, and uh, all of these cyclones have track information, which is the latitude and the longitude, and they have the the wind intensity in knots. So uh, we developed different uh, neural network models to predict them. And uh, uh, just last year, we um, found that uh, we, we provided an investigation on the way we should uh, encode those cyclone, the cyclone data, and what is the best uh, way to encode, break down that, the problem and encode the data. Basically what we did, we we used, let's say, two decades of cyclones. Uh, we concatenated them, the latitude and the longitude data of two, two decades of cyclones. And then uh, in the first architecture, we used, uh, uh, one of them, we used uh, two input neurons in the recurrent neural network, where one is for latitude and one is for longitude. And we had two output neurons, one for latitude and one for longitude. And that we did the first time, and then later we, we used a simpler approach where we just used one input neuron. And um, we found that uh, we improved the results quite significantly. And this is the results, uh, the root mean squared error is one way to measure the performance of prediction. And we found that uh, uh, either using neuroevolution, cooperative coevolution or back propagation through time, both of them with the one where we use one input neuron, we 
significantly improve the root mean squared error. So that kind of uh, uh, gives us more motivation to take this further and uh, develop uh, more work, uh, do more work on this. And this is, a, this is just an example of the, the prediction of the latitude, and uh, this is the, the difference in the error. And of course, uh, you see that even it's a root mean squared error, for example, of 0 0.02, which is very low, but we do have uh, big error bars. In that case, in, in the longitude, we have smaller error bars. Why is it so is uh, uh, open for further investigation. And uh, just a prediction for five different cyclones. And we would like to have more uncertainty uh, quantification around this and so on that I will discuss. So uh, basically, uh, that is what we found that uh, the, the first method, uh, the, uh, the way you encode the, the cyclones, the way you break down the problem makes a huge difference in the prediction performance. Moving on, then uh, I was given, uh, I, I was also exploring uh, uh, the wind intensity. So that's like a, we were doing as a, top, a different topic. So uh, the, to predict the wind intensity of tropical cyclones, and we looked mostly at South Pacific and South Indian Ocean. And uh, one thing uh, for the, the cyclone uh, for time series prediction is, you break your time series prediction uh, uh, problem into data points. And uh, for example, the, this is broken into windows. And those windows, depending on their size, the size of the window, the dimension could be, let's say, three or five or seven or nine. And that defines how, how much further back words you are going to actually predict tomorrow. So, for a cyclone, maybe you are going, you need the data for the last two days to predict what will be in the next six hours. You need data for the last 36 hours or data for the last 72 hours. So how far back you are going in terms of data to predict the, the future. And that is, uh, so we, we, uh, we found that interesting because we, uh, we did an investigation of the different time span. So we defined that as time span, how far back you're going. And each, each point of data, the, the cyclone uh, that is uh, data that is available through the uh, Navy website, uh, US Navy website, it's, it's uh, recorded every six hours. So uh, if you are, if minimal you have four, you need four data points, that means you have to wait for 24 hours to start making a prediction. That's what it means. Or, uh, so uh, here, then we did a training, we trained a recurrent neural network with three, four to eight uh, time span. That means how far backwards you are going. And then we were testing, uh, in this particular case, we used five, time span of five. We trained using time span of five, and then we uh, tested that on time span of three, four, and the rest. Meaning that in the training data set was uh, constructed with a time span of five, the neural network was trained with a time span of five, but the testing was constructed with a time span of three, four, and the rest. And you can see, that if you train your network with one time span, it doesn't really do well on the other time span. So that is why uh, I, I, I define this problem as a minimum time span problem that is required for, for this uh, extreme climates. And this uh, is uh, applicable to storms, rainy season, and so on, that how much of uh, time backward uh, information you need. So uh, I have done some work to address this further. I will go on to that next, uh, after this. The other, uh, the other climate extreme was rapid intensification. And this, is a, this has been a hot problem for a few decades uh, amongst meteorologists. Uh, rapid intensification is when a cyclone um, rapidly intensifies of, 
with the difference of uh, more than 30 knots in 24 hours. So your, your cyclone, uh, uh, the wind intensity, let's say, was 100 knots, but in 24 hours it became 130 knots, something like that. So just the difference of 30 knots. And, um, but uh, some uh, meteorologists in the literature have also said uh, rapid intensification is uh, uh, by uh, 10 knots or 20 knots. So we, uh, we looked at the cyclones from the South Pacific and South Indian Ocean again. And we first investigated on the duration of the cyclone, the number of days, for example, or oh, the number of hours that a cyclone, uh, uh, and uh, its uh, relationship to rapid intensification. Is it that uh, cyclones that uh, last longer have more rapid intensification cases, for example? That was just to understand the data set. And we found that there's not uh, much uh, direct relationship uh, in uh, the duration of the cyclone versus the, the intensification, uh, the number of uh, repeat intensification cases. And we uh, kind of uh, used the recurrent neural networks to predict the rapid intensification. And then we, uh, we had two strategies where we defined rapid intensification as 30 knots and the other as 10 knots. And uh, here you could see that it says that we have a huge uh, quite a good, interesting uh, percentage uh, generalization in terms of uh, correctly classified. We have 92 and 79%. But if we look at the confusion metrics, the confusion metrics looks at the true positive and true negative cases. And here we see that we the data set is really unbalanced. Uh, we have a huge uh, uh, portion of the data set which is negative. And so to predict the true positive, uh, it is not really successful. And uh, the same, then we uh, you looked at the case of the strategy, strategy two, and we found that we have, uh, in this one, because the rapid intensification is defined by 10 knots, we have more uh, data set in the positive, but, but uh, out of the total, only 50 of the positive out of 116 were, correctly classified. So uh, this kind of again outlines this, uh, uh, this, this uh, uh, work outlines the challenge that we have of uh, unbalanced data set. And uh, then there are other things to take into consideration, not just the wind intensity of the past few days, of uh, past few uh, uh, past hours or time span, but um, also uh, other things such as uh, taking into account the humidity, the, the location of the cyclone, the sea surface temperature and so on to improve the rapid intensification problem. And uh, there's a lot of work that can be done in this area. So uh, moving back to uh, machine learning uh, uh, background. Uh, so there's a number of different learning strategies in machine learning, for example, supervised learning, unsupervised learning, and so on. And one of them is called transfer learning. And transfer learning uh, is, uh, it, it involves uh, making use of knowledge from previous uh, examples or cases. Or, and uh, the example, a simple example of transfer learning is that you, uh, you learned how to drive a tractor and uh, then you are learning to drive a car and versus somebody who just learns to drive a car directly, a person who, has, who already knows how to drive a tractor, they will use that knowledge from that previous uh, uh, task to drive the car. So for them, they will be more comfortable in driving or they will learn faster than somebody who is just new to drive the cars. So this is one uh, um, scenario of transfer learning. And that, uh, is idea is usually usually used uh, in the cases where you have limited data. For example, there for the South Pacific cyclones, we do not have that much data set when we compare to a South Indian uh, data set or the other locations of cyclones. So we could use the other locations as source data sets, and then use that knowledge and transfer the knowledge, which is the weights of the network, for example, into the 
the target data set for the South Pacific. And uh, the other area is multitask learning. So it is that, okay, you drive the tractor. So in the case of transfer learning is that the knowledge that you learned to drive uh, the tractor is transferred in driving cars, but now you do not care if you can drive the tractor anymore. So you are just caring about your, your target data, which is the South Pacific. You do not care about the South Indian and the other data sets. But multitask learning on the other hand is that you know how to drive the car and you can also drive the tractor as, as well. So in here, we want to develop uh, models that can take care of the different regions of cyclones, for example. And this uh, cyclone is just an example. It could be any uh, other extreme uh, climate problem or any other data set. So uh, basically, your uh, trained uh, networks are mapped into a multitask network and the data is transferred. So these ideas I used uh, to uh, fuse with uh, neuroevolution, coevolution, and I used it for, um, I developed a an, uh, an multitask neuroevolution framework to, uh, for multiple step ahead prediction. So for all the cyclone cases I was talking about that you just predict what will be the intensity in the next six hours. But what if we want to find the intensity of the next uh, 100 hours or so. So that is uh, classified as multiple step ahead prediction. So I used uh, the knowledge from the step ahead, uh, from the like uh, one step ahead into the steps in the future. And that knowledge is transferred from here and it goes down. And um, I have provided the reference for this report. Um, Sorry. Sorry, I just uh, confused uh, this. Uh, I, I quickly discussed this. I was showing the wrong example. So this is the multiple step ahead. So we use the uh, knowledge from the previous time steps in the future time steps to predict uh, many steps ahead in the future. So this is uh, convolutionary multitask learning. And, but I have not applied this for cyclones and comparing with the uh, cases where we have single step uh, where we have the conventional approaches. You see this is the multiple step ahead, the blue, and that kind of produces a, a concise, a coherent uh, prediction, uh, quite robust when the steps are uh, increasing ahead in, in future. So this is the 10th time step, whereas the others, uh, they are uh, not so robust. And uh, this kind of beats the performance of the other two methods. So uh, moving back, uh, the problem, that was a multiple step ahead prediction. This is the dynamic time series prediction. This is uh, developing that same, uh, the, using the same ideas to address the minimal time span problem. And the minimal time span problem was how much farther back you need to uh, go, you, information you need to predict the future. And, uh, and that uh, was, done by coevolutionary multitask learning. And here, it, uh, to, to address that problem, basically what I want is, if you have a cyclone, just a data of six hours, you should be able to predict the, the future. So you, we utilize that information into a neural network where there's transfer of knowledge into using this, this approach. So we have two, two data, or it could be even one, times span, this is two times span and so on. And so as uh, you get data, you still make a prediction. So even you have one data point, when uh, the cyclone just began, you should be able to make a prediction. Rather than waiting for 24, 24 or 36 hours, you should uh, continuously make prediction on the fly. So that's dynamic time series prediction. And this is the technical report. and. The results basically show that uh, compared to other methods, uh, the CMTL, the coevolutionary multitask uh, method, which is the yellow line kind of does quite well as the time, in time span increases. 
So uh, moving on, we have, I'm running out of time. So all these methods that I've talked about, they could be extended further using Bayesian methods. And uh, Bayesian inference basically looks at, uh, it's a area of uh, statistics uh, based uh, and probability theory where you uh, compute the posterior probability according to a hypothesis and prior probability and the marginal likelihood. So this is computed using the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithms in most real world applications because it's difficult to compute it analytically. And um, there are a number of uh, MCMC algorithms. You could see it as a way of uh, finding the, uh, the near optimal values of a, of a neural network. It, it is also could be used for training neural networks where you get uncertainty. So uh, this is, uh, for example, for a very simple case, you, you generate, you generate uh, uh, solutions from a sample and then those that are accepted, you get a probability distribution over time. So um, uh, uh, just an example, we had a model, not a neural network, but just a model which is a mixture of normals. And uh, the, the course line here is the data. And uh, we um, generated uh, the, the three uh, variables that you need to find here is the mean, uh, the variance, and the, the weights. So we had uh, this a mixture of normal distribution, this model. And using MCMC, we, these are all the accepted proposals, right? And of those accepted proposals, when we take the mean and the, the, uh, the fifth and the 95th percentile, you get this error estimate. So this is uh, the, uh, a form of uh, uncertainty quantification. Uh, this, uh, there are different types of uh, Monte Carlo algorithms. And uh, uh, we just use the basic uh, MCMC with the random work, but uh, there are others such as sequential Monte Carlo methods and uh, rejection sampling and so on. So to use these Monte Carlo methods to train neural networks, this is known as Bayesian neural networks. And currently there's a lot of uh, discussion in the area of Bayesian deep learning. Basically, instead of uh, uh, one point estimate, which means one uh, value for weight, you have like a list of uh, uh, accepted uh, values of weights, which could be seen as a probability distribution. And uh, we, uh, we used, we recently developed a, a hybrid gradient descent we used with the MCMC algorithm, which is called Levengian Dynamics. And this is just a, we applied on a time series prediction problem, which is the sunspot time series, which is a benchmark problem. And this is the plot of all the accepted proposals. Note that in the MCMC, the first 10% of the accepted proposals are usually discarded. So all these ones that are not close to, actually this is how the time series looks like. So all those that are not uh, uh, near the, the optimal values, the first 10, they are the 10% and they are discarded. And this is uh, basically the fifth and the 95th percentile with the mean prediction. So you can see that that's the error with the, the red mark, uh, the, the blue is the actual and the, the orange is the, the mean. And at the end, we have probability distributions for each of those weights of the neural network. We had 30 weights and bias, and uh, the box plot kind of just shows uh, a probability distribution in, in this form. And um, in cases where the, like, there's no likelihood function or it is difficult to compute a likelihood function, you need to uh, use approximate Bayesian computation. and uh, just as uh, we, uh, dis, uh, we uh, propose uh, from uh, in MCMC, we also propose in uh, IBC from a sample, we draw from a sample, but we uh, provide uh, some uh, um, 
uncertainty through adding noise to distributions and then we either reject or accept them based on an epsilon. And this is just uh, the slide from, uh, from Wikipedia page. So, um, Now moving on, so we, those are some of the things that we have done and uh, uh, landscape dynamics and geocoastal modeling. So this area you know very well, most of you, of course. Uh, so one area is bedlands, so Bayesian and landscape dynamics, and that's what we understand. It is a, a software that uses uh, some uh, geophysical equations probably to, to um, show uh, how um, a landscape is uh, deformed or changed over time due to weather conditions and so on. So this was the example. And uh, we think that we could use some of our methods in this area and uh, modeling uh, coral reefs using pi reef. And uh, this is the flow chart. And in some of these areas, we could use uh, the methods that I have discussed. So I've just summarized uh, what can be done. So uh, Bayesian learning and optimization can be used to model uncertainty. And this could be for all the different areas that I have already discussed, uh, climate extremes, for example. And uh, this could be also for uh, badlands and pi reef. We are already looking at uh, one example uh, with pi reef. Um, and, uh, we are using Bayesian optimization to, uh, to um, get the optimal values and also uh, model uncertainty. Um, the same uh, ideas can be used for bedlands and we are exploring that. And uh, approximate Bayesian uh, computation could be used where it is difficult to obtain data. And for the PyDiff case, we, we have this PyRIF model, but the data of, uh, that is drilled from the course, it's uh, not enough. It's a very little data problem. And that's, where we are, that's why we are using approximate Bayesian computation to move into that area. And we always usually have uh, climate problems, change problems with lots of sources of data. For example, cyclones I've already discussed, the same applies for example, air pollution. And you have these cases of air pollution in Delhi, you have case of air pollution in Beijing, for example, these two are known for air pollution um, cases. And uh, they are to develop prediction models, you could utilize both, both of these uh, data sets or, and also uh, other data sets all around the world. And they could be used in, uh, in, um, in any approach. You could use it as a transfer learning when you are just uh, worried about one city or a multitask learning approach where you are learning about uh, worried about multiple cities and uh, situations um, and uh, this uh, can ex also be extended to storms and cyclone prediction Pro possibly the rapid intensification of tropical cyclones as you saw that it is a unbalanced data set problem. We do not have that many cases of rapid intensification. We have more negative cases than we have positive cases. We have like 99% uh, negative, uh, negative cases and less than 1% positive cases in the, if you mine the data that way. There are many other ways we need to look at how we extract uh, the information for rapid intensification and uh, various forms of uh, data and features we could use uh, and uh, they could be used in ensemble learning or transfer and multitask uh, learning uh, could be utilized in them and uh, Bayesian neural networks could be used to uh, provide uh, um, uncertainty quantification for these uh, methods uh, for these areas and uh, moreover, the final part is uh, using machine learning methods in, uh, in uh, softwares that require a lot of computation time uh, due to those physical models. Uh, for example, bed lens, if it is uh, uh, 
applied to all uh, to uh, larger areas and uh, related software models where they are the physical equations take a lot of computation time we could use we could generate data from those models and use machine learning methods as surrogates to assist models and thus the surrogates can be also used uh, in a optimization problem where the to evaluate the objective function or the problem is very difficult or expensive to uh, evaluate um, so some resources um, we have the MOOCs for neural network courses going on and uh, we are in week five this week week six will be next week we'll discuss convolutional neural networks and LSTM next week and everything is available online um, all the code for the related methods that I've talked in this talk is in my GitHub, research papers available online, and some uh, machine learning uh, meta, uh, libraries, Keras, Skitlen, and MCMC uh, Python library is also there. And you could also download the slides later from my uh, GitHub, GitHub profile. And that's all. Uh, I was very interested in these bad labs. I'm curious what would be the feedback of this kind of thing. Uh, because the bad labs is a talk where you should have some ratings. Like so it runs based on very specific rules, which, which is hard to change. I mean, you need to have some very solid idea to change the equations and change the that intensities of each term. So you have an input, you have an output at the end, at the initial you have an input. So how how does this method can provide feedback based on physical processes of the circuit on the circuit? I'm I i i really do not get to which way in the yeah, yeah, you got my point. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, we have been discussing that. Actually, we are just in the beginning of this project. And uh, we begin uh, with, uh, there are some variables that uh, need to be optimized. And uh, anywhere where there's a one-point estimate, we could use Bayesian optimization methods to get uncertainty around it. So, uh, meaning that you see a, uh, you see a surface here, but how how exact is this uh, surface? I mean, how what is the certainty that this surface? How certain are you? How certain is bed lens that this surface is should be like this? It's based on some physical equations, as you say. But if there are some parameters that are used in those equations, some assumptions that are used in these equations, we can exploit those assumptions and validate it through the uncertainty quantification of Bayesian methods. So, so you feed the inputs on this one? So, um, um, the, uh, we are just, uh, uh, I could just uh, discuss the example, which is very similar we are using in PyReef. We did more work in that one where we, uh, there were a number of uh, variables that, uh, were ne that were needed to be optimized. And uh, uh, Jody is here. And so uh, we, uh, we used Bayesian optimization to get probability distributions uh, around them. And uh, because the data set that we had there, the, that was drilled for, for the reef, it, did not have that much of information. So uh, we needed to uh, quantify the uncertainty in that case because there are some variables in uh, PyReef that needs to be optimized. So rather than just using some optimization uh, method, uh, for example, simplex or any other algorithm, 
that gives a one point estimate we used the Bayesian approximate Bayesian computation in that case. Um, the other thing is uh, that in the case of bed lengths, it depends what you compare your model with. So uh, let's say that you, uh, I mean, I've been told that there's uh, some physical data like the size from the seismic activity, uh, seismic data or something. So uh, that data set, how, how, sh how much sure you are about that da data set or Maybe you are looking at in some area where that data set is not available, but you want to use you you want to use data set from different area and you know that you're not really certain. So those type of assumptions you use in even in bed lens. So uh, to uh, to be sure, more sure about those assumptions, we need a Bayesian approach uh, of uh, uncertainty quantification. But this is uh, not using machine learning at the moment, but we could use the machine learning components if there are some physical equations there that are too expensive to optimize. If you are, it's taking too much time, then we could use things like uh, recurrent or convolutional networks and so on. Sorry, I'm just getting into this, so yeah. Maybe um, as part of like further explanation, some questions also like, there are all these rules that go into these whole processes that have to um, um, like run like around that. And I guess like the fundamental um, equations don't really change, but the ones that the ones you can that there is some uncertainty and that change. So for tiring, for instance, um, in terms of like <coughs> using a species competition model to represent how um, different colonies and individual exist in different places. Um, and the basic equations don't change, it's like a basic kind of thing, but other things around it that are getting close to it. And that's what we can optimize around. And that's what we're trying to optimize, um, not the equation that we're using. Just in case I have to go to that question. Can I just add an additional comment? So, the, the, the thing about badlands, for example, <coughs> that it, there's, a, there's a parameter uh, um, that, that's the erodibility of the material. But it doesn't correspond to an exact equation. It's just a proxy, right? It's just a, it's just a number that you just pull out of the hat, you know, that, 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 that's going to approximate you know, how, how, how erodible the, 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 the part of the continent might be, right? And it would be very complex to actually figure out the combination of physical and chemical weathering, how it might affect different rocks, and then you would have to know exactly what rocks are at the surface at a given time. So that's a huge uncertainty. I think about the sediment thing, that's why that's what I was referring to. So you, 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 you might have a, uh, you, you, that's one of the things you're trying to reproduce. You're eroding material, you're transferring the sediment, you're putting it somewhere else. And then uh, if you're lucky, you have the, the, the observed total sediment thickness, right? But so, uh, but so that total sediment thickness oftentimes is actually not that accurate in time, right? It's, uh, and so then, there, there might be an uncertainty, even in this one, even in that number, and let alone the time dependence of sediment accumulation might be quite, quite uncertain. It was most of it positive in the early part of the history or the later part, right? And so, so, so there's, there's a lot of uncertainty, you know, both in some of the observations that you're trying to use to ground this model. There's also yeah, some uncertainty in the parameters that you're using to drive the model, like the erodibility of the theory. So those, are all, these are all the places where there are opportunities to use Bayesian to ask yourself, okay, so what's what, what's the effect to, to to sort of generate a prior probability distribution to say, okay, so what, you know, it's not just a number, but you know, the sediment thickness could be something from here to there. We're not really sure of the erodibility could be something into there, and how the rainfall, uh, you know, that we describe in the model is also another thing. It's a parameter that's not very well known. It's for the you know the range between x and y. Normally distributed fashion. So, yeah, so there's lots of opportunities there to supply these methods. Yes, we should. Uh, so, so, if you're saying there is people interested in, the, in forecasting like in the future, the cyclone is, a, is an example. If you want to know when the cyclone, uh, how it will evolve, 
how far the person is going to ascend into speed of the winds when this uh, happens. Um, there was also people interested in, uh, in doing aqua. Um, uh, what was the earth like, you know, uh, beyond 10 million, 20 million years ago? We tried to figure out that based on observation that we did today. So, looking at the cyclone, you know, analogy, it's, it's when we use prediction uh, forward to understand that you look at uh, the recent past evolution of the cyclone and you try to figure out. The evolution of But let's say that you have, you know, you know uh, the cyclone and a particular point in time. Uh, can you figure out you know, where the cyclone was coming from? And how far can you go back to the point in time? You can see that's a lot of, uh, or another way, looking at that land, you look at the landscape, uh, you have a particular morphology. Can you tell, can you use those techniques to figure out the morphology uh, in the past? So, in other words, how those techniques work in both ways, the future and, and the past? Um, the past is, uh, I, I get your point. I mean, uh, what we are doing now is we are just concatenating, stacking cyclones together and just making a prediction of if we have a few, the goal is uh, that uh, we uh, try to, if there's a new cyclone coming, we try to our best to say, what is the future of this cyclone in terms of the, the direction it is taking and the wind intensity or will it have rapid, will it rapidly intensify? But your, your interest, uh, question is very interesting in uh, understanding the, the evolution of the climate in terms of the last few decades of cyclones we have, uh, new cyclones that are becoming a category. We have uh, just recently in Fiji, we had uh, 2016, we had a category five cyclone and that was really bad for the country and uh, some people, number of people were dead. So uh, why do we have that type of cyclones? And we have, if we look at the evolution of the cyclones in the last 30 or 40 years, that much of data we have, we could, could uh, develop models in terms of not just predicting cyclone but using machine learning as a tool to understand them more of why specific behaviors that they they have is it due to a more ocean um, uh, surface step sea surface temperature or is it due to more humidity or due to um, these these other effects that we have that we did not have in the past, but that we can do only if we have more data of those cyclones with, with the, the similar effects of, for example, the sea surface temperature if we have for the last 20, 30 years, then we can always compare that, those with the cyclones and we can use all these different types of machine learning tools, not to pre pre use them for developing predictive models, but to understand the behavior of uh, such climate extremes. And uh, the bigger question, is, of course, is also why does a cyclone uh, rapidly intensify? What properties cause the rapid intensification? Those dynamics need to be fully understood. But uh, <clears throat> so far, the, the past cyclone data was recorded every six hours. So that, that data is not very informative. We have um, better recording of cyclones now. But uh, in relation to that with bad lens, um, it's something to think about the evolution of these cyclones, for example. And uh, I just want to uh, also point out a limitation in this. Uh, the, the, the machine learning techniques have uh, given some uh, interesting observations, but we have not really collaborated with metrologists and weather, weather stations on that level to really compare our methods and to see what type of methods they are using. They are, they're, they're, the weather prediction models are more geophysical uh, models and they, they do not use machine learning techniques on this level at least. So uh, we need to, this is one of our major limitations, to sit down with them as we are discussing with you here about I think that's the reason why weather forecasting is so bad at times. <laughs>
could be and the other thing is that we we note that all the even the 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 weather forecasting you see the temperature forecasting for the day i usually check that we don't have the uncertainty information in there and uh, i think with this uh, bayesian machine learning tools we could uh, quite easily develop uh, tools that provide those uncertainty information as you go further into the uh, multiple step uh, ahead case the multiple step prediction the pr problem with multiple step prediction is that as you go further your uh, your uh, predict uh, you will accumulate errors and you will your prediction will not be that uh, certain and that is what the the exact case of weather prediction for the for for a week ahead that they are giving but with this once we apply the Bayesian methods, we would be able to provide the uncertainty quantification, and that's what I will be looking at next. So, but, and to sit with them and try to discuss this will be interesting. Too. Any other questions or comments? I think we've run out of time, then by the guys, so we should probably okay. uh, wrap it up. Continue discussions over lunch or something. Uh, I've got to go to Adelaide or something. So I have to rush off to the airport. Uh, the rest of you should go and grab some good content. Continue the discussion over lunch. So thanks again for a really interesting talk. Thank you.